Today's book is The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. So, a Hemingway book. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think, by my estimation, kind of four iconic Hemingway books, or kind of four Hemingway books everybody knows. Uh, a Farewell to Arms, For Whom the Bell Tolls, The Old Men in the Sea, and The Sun Also Rises. If I'm missing something, let me know. Uh, but th those are all the books that kind of pop up to me. Um, of those books, kind of my brief history, brief, brief overview of my history with Hemingway, I read A Farewell to Arms in high school, or rather I had to read it. It was kind of assigned reading for 11th grade English. Um, I didn't hate it, but I, uh, I kind of struggled through it a bit. In retrospect, I think I was too young to read Hemingway. Arguably, all 16-year-olds are too young to read Hemingway, but I, I don't know, I should only speak for myself. Uh, if, if you enjoyed Hemingway at 16, you, great. For me, I was too young. And I think, you know, a lot of this kind of stuff Hemingway writes about, his obsession with writing about, like, all the alcohol that they were drinking and naming the alcohol and talking about what it tasted like and the whole kind of um, cult of masculinity and stuff like that. Um, I, at 16, I just wasn't into that. Uh, I um, uh, had no knowledge of what alcohol was like, wasn't into this cult of masculinity and stuff like that. I don't know, m maybe some people are. Um, and I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't appreciate his prose at the time. I, I think I hadn't developed myself as a reader. <clears throat> About 10 years later, kind of roughly in my mid-20s, I read a short story of Hemingway's uh, in a short story collection and found, to my surprise, that I really enjoyed it. Um, and so I read For Whom the Bell Tolls next. For Whom the Bell Tolls was a book I had been wanting to read anyways uh, because it was about the Spanish Civil War and I was interested in the Spanish Civil War. It was one of my history interests. Um, and uh, once I had kind of discovered that actually I didn't hate Hemingway after all. I went back and read that book and I really enjoyed it. Uh, like, that, that was one of my favorite books. And I don't know why, I mean, I should have just kept going with Hemingway, but I didn't. I don't know why. Um, but this is a book that I finally got around to reading. I should have read it years ago because people have been recommending it to me for years. Uh, People I know personally kind of have been recommending it to me. And also, it's, I've seen it recommended like on the internet and on these various kind of lists uh, of kind of books to read. Um, it, it comes up a lot. So uh, this book, kind of in addition to being one of the kind of the four classic Hemingway books, this is also kind of uh, the quintessential Lost Generation book, uh, the, the book about the Lost Generation. And in fact, my understanding is, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, uh, my understanding is without the popularity of this book, the term, the lost generation, would not have been popularized. Hemingway didn't invent the term. Gertrude Stein uh, apparently coined the term. Um, but the success of this book kind of helped make that term into the, the public vernacular. So I'm given to understand. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. The, the words the lost generation do not occur anywhere in the pages of the book. Um, but in the introduction to the book, they've got a couple of opening quotes. One is from Ecclesiastes, and that's where the, the sun also rises comes from. The title comes from a, a verse in Ecclesiastes. And then the other is a quote from Gertrude Stein, attributed to Gertrude Stein, um, said, you are all a lost generation, which I think Gertrude Stein said to Hemingway in conversation, maybe, and then Hemingway just kind of put it in the introduction to his novel. Uh, and that's, that's how that kind of term became so popular. This book is Hemingway's first novel. Uh, every, every, it, every, all the other novels came after that. Uh, and this was, uh, people say, people who are more literary than me, that this was kind of Hemingway emerging onto the world scene fully formed. Uh, so before this novel, kind of nobody had heard of him. After this novel, he was a household name. And by the time he got around to writing this novel, 
uh, he had been kind of practicing his art kind of on short stories and writing and stuff like that, that this kind of represented Hemingway as we know him with all kind of his literary talents developed. Uh, so everything you kind of associate with Hemingway was already kind of fully formed and on display in this book. Uh, now the plot of the book um, is interesting or uh, interesting kind of maybe interesting for being not interesting. Uh, in interesting in the sense it's a little bit strange or uh, well here what I mean is the the book is uh, it doesn't really have a discernible plot especially in the first half it's uh, Hemingway and all his friends kind of drinking in Paris and then they go to the Spain to see the bullfights and so it's then it's uh, a kind of a smaller group of friends because you know they leave some people behind in Paris not the whole gang doesn't go but about, you know, like five or six of them go to Spain to see these bullfights. And so it's a smaller group of friends just drinking in Spain. Uh, and the book is heavily based on real life. Uh, the literary term for this is Roman Aclef, I believe, although I think you're supposed to pronounce it like with a French accent or something. Roman Aclef, I don't know. But, but it's, it's a, the idea for the book is you take an event from real life, you change everybody's name so you don't get sued, and so like it's real life kind of masquerading as a novel. Uh, so apparently, if you, if you go into the research for this, sometimes it's a little bit confusing how much is true to life, because apparently some details did get changed. Uh, like one thing I heard is, uh, the lake that they went fishing at in real life uh, on this trip, the lake was actually polluted and they didn't have a very good time in there because the lake was polluted. In the novel, it's like this pristine nature experience. And so that, that's kind of one detail that got fudged and there was reasons for that. I think Hemingway, literary reasons for that, Hemingway wanted to present kind of this pristine nature retreat in kind of contrast to the decadence of the city. Um, but apparently, uh, just kind of based on the research I was doing and stuff like that, most of this novel is kind of directly from real life, uh, even down to like a lot of the little details just come out of real life. Apparently a lot of the dialogue is lifted out of real life, like Hemingway kind of had uh, an amazing memory, uh, the rat trap memory they called it, so he was able to remember all of these conversations. Um, now, of course, like the dialogue is quintessentially Hemingway's. Uh, you know, he's got that kind of famous reputation for the dialogue. Um, but uh, apparently, all the conversations come out of real life. All maybe as strong. Um, so, even though it's kind of a fictional character, Jake, and his fictional friends. Uh, and in reality, this is based on the real-life Hemingway and his real-life friends just getting drunk all the time in Paris and then going to Spain and getting drunk. Uh, so it's always, I don't know, it's one of those things where you're reading the novel that kind of what lens to read this through. Um, do you kind of read this as memoirs or do you read this as literature? Uh, and Hemingway had certain themes he was trying to work in here, so apparently like stuff got rewritten to emphasize his themes or kind of adjusted and stuff like that. Um, I don't, I mean, it, it, it would be interesting to know really kind of exactly some of these conversations, exactly what got adjusted and what is from real life. Uh, I don't know enough to critique it on those grounds and you know, maybe, maybe some of this is just unknowable, uh, how much Hemingway changed the conversations or stuff like that. So I, I, at the end of the day, I, you do kind of maybe just have to judge the book on its own and kind of forget that this is all based on real life, uh, although it's hard to do that. So uh, Hemingway, Hemingway's got a style, um, and it, it's interesting. That, uh, I've just 
read recently, for the, um, relatively recently, a couple books that were contemporary with this from the 1920s. Uh, E.M. Forster's A Passage to India and D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. And both of those books definitely had their merits, but there were descriptive passages that were kind of, you got bogged down and they were a little bit of a slog to read. Hemingway is writing in exactly the same time period, but he's got these kind of very short sentences and very kind of sparse descriptions that evoke kind of just enough in your mind and very kind of short, clippy dialogue. And the book just moves. And like it, even though the you're reading it and you're like, I, I don't understand. What's the point of all this? What's the plot? Why, why is he writing about this? Because like on the surface level, it sounds like he's just writing about him and his buddies getting drunk for like weeks on end. And you're like, well, why, why is this great literature? It's just like a, you know, like a, a bunch of drunks writing about all the times they got drunk. Um, but, you know, like the style, it moves. Uh, and, you know, the characters, even though there's not much of a plot, the characters are moving around, you know, they're at one bar, they go to a different bar, then you pick up with them the next day, and then they go out to uh, lunch, and then they're walking down the streets of Paris. And then the second half, they're kind of moving across countries and stuff like that. And they're also, the conversation is moving, they're talking about a lot of different things. So, even though there's... You, you, you're kind of left a little bit confused by the lack of maybe a traditional plot in this book. It's very easy to read, like you keep turning the pages, it's a very kind of smooth, easy read. Uh, at, le at least that was my experience. Um, now I got to the end of this book and I thought, okay, Hemingway is a very talented writer. He's got you know, very iconic dialogue, very iconic descriptions, but like, is this great art or is this just, you know, everybody gets drunk all the time and Hemingway writes about it. Um, but then after I finished the book, I researched it a little bit on the internet, kind of very surface level, Wikipedia, you know, Spark Notes, uh, watched a couple YouTube lectures on it. Uh, and apparently, you know, there's a lot of symbolism in this book that I, uh, I didn't even catch when I was reading it. I just thought it was a bunch of kind of drunks kind of out uh, getting drunk. Um, so I think, you know, this is one of those books. I'm a person of limited intelligence, perhaps limited intelligence. I just engaged with it on the surface level and you can do that. And that's, I guess that's what I did. But people who want to dig deeper, uh, apparently there's a lot of kind of deeper stuff to dig into here. Uh, but certainly on the surface level, it's just about Hemingway and his buddies getting drunk all the time. Um, so uh, let me just talk a little bit about that because I think you have to talk about the surface level of this. Um, something I remember from A Farewell to Arms, which I read way back when I was 16, is this kind of weird thing Hemingway has for describing all the drinks that his characters are drinking. Uh, so it's not just enough to, I mean, like, it's a, it's a bit bizarre because like a, a, a normal author would just kind of maybe even skip it completely. Like who cares if they were drinking, just kind of leave that out. Or if for some reason it's important to the story that they were constantly drinking alcohol or whatever, than just say they were drinking alcohol. Hemingway has to feel like he's constantly naming every alcoholic drink uh, he, he drinks. And I remember this from you know high school, Farewell to Arms, because we were like, what, why is this in here? Like why, why are we reading through Hemingway's drinking list when it's supposed to be a work of great literature? And the, the high school teacher just kind of laughed it off. She's like, yeah, Hemingway. You know, this, this, the, the, these are his eccentricities, you know, genius, but all these geniuses have eccentricities, and Hemingway likes to list all the drinks in his novel. Um, but, like, if that was true of 
a farewell to arms, I think that's doubly true, triply true, of the sun also rises, because the whole book is like them drinking. So you're just kind of reading everything that they drank and kind of how it tasted and stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's a little bit, on the surface level, it strikes me as a little bit bizarre. I mean, like, I guess Hemingway really liked his alcohol and he took his drinking seriously. So, but like to, why, why he assumed the reader would care about the, you know, all, all the different drinks his characters are drinking. Uh, I don't know. Although, again, when I did some research for this, People claim that Hemingway used these different types of alcohol for different literary effects. So, I, I, you know, apparently there's different moods associated with a different alcohol. You get kind of one kind of mood associated with the vermouth, another sort of mood associated with the cognac, and he kind of weaves that in to kind of create the scene. So you can kind of almost tell how a character is feeling by what he's drinking. The other thing, if you want to go even a step deeper than this, is uh, I, you know, I watched some videos where people were talking, some lectures on Hemingway, uh, that this kind of drinking is like an existential thing. Like, um, I'm, I'm not going to do this justice. Uh, watch somebody smarter than me discuss this. But the, the basic idea I got is like Hemingway took kind of a dim view of life. You know, you're not religious or you're agnostic or something like that, so you're not sure what the purpose of life is. Uh, a lot of people kind of find meaning in their communities, but Hemingway apparently took a dim view of community. Like, people are just nasty to each other all the time. Your best friend will stab you in the back if he has a chance. Um, and you, that comes through in this novel. Uh, you know, they're all friends, and yet they're kind of all horrible to each other, and they, you know, talk about each other behind each other's back and steal each other's girls and you know they're all, they're all kind of terrible people so what do you do um, alcohol is just kind of one way to fill the void uh, because you know kind of life is meaningless and awful so these characters kind of drink to distraction uh, the other thing that got hinted at and this comes back to the Lady Chatterley's lover which I've read previously the idea of kind of how the, the, the essence of life is based off of the kind of the physicalities of it, the physical senses and kind of the, well, the food, I guess, and the drink and the sex. And the main character in this book is impotent. Uh, he's got a war wound, which has kind of left him impotent. Uh, and so the, the, the sex is out the window for him. Uh, and so that's why kind of he drinks all the more. Uh, and that, that I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that while I was reading the book. But then once I kind of heard that, I was like, oh yeah, maybe there's something to that. Or I don't know, maybe there's not. Maybe that's giving him away too much credit because like, in real life, Hemingway was an alcoholic, and you know he continued to drink heavily before, after, before, during, and after the publication of this book. So you know if 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 Heming, I mean if he's kind of criticizing this drinking as people kind of using this drinking to kind of fill a void that can't be vo filled, that self awareness did not carry into his real life. Or I don't know, maybe, maybe it did. Maybe he was a self-aware alcoholic who knew exactly what he was doing. Um, yeah, who, I, I don't know, I guess, is, is, is the long and the short of it. Um, but either way, the drinking is a major part of this book. And it's, it's boy, these guys drink a lot. Uh, and um, Hemingway apparently had quite a tolerance for alcohol and he was obviously one of these people who alcohol fueled. Um, now I find this a little bit hard to identify with because I'm not that guy. I think alcohol affects people differently in different ways. But I've got a very limited tolerance of alcohol. Uh, and I know this and I also know it makes me sleepy very quickly. So, I, you know, I 
when I go out, I do not start drinking alcohol unless I figure, okay, I'm going to be home in a couple hours. Th then I'll have a few or something like that. Uh, but, like, I would never, like, drink all through the day. Like, I just... It would just make me fall asleep early in the day or something. Um, but not all people are like that. Some people drink all through the day and the alcohol fuels them. Or, or fuels them all through the night. Uh, Hemingway was apparently like that. And either kind of all of his crowd was like that. Or I don't know, maybe Hemingway, the writer, kind of self-projected this onto the other characters. But they're just kind of the whole day drinking down wine and stuff like that. Um, and you kind of read this book and it, you know, it makes you want to drink while you're reading it because you're, you're reading about people drinking the whole time. So there was at least one occasion uh, while I was reading this book, I thought, well, you know, the whole, I was reading about the section in Spain and it's like this whole section is just all about them drinking all this wine. So I thought I, I should drink some wine while I'm reading this. So I got a bottle of wine and then I had a couple glasses while I was reading it, and then I just felt sleepy. And uh, the, the, wine, the wine actually did not improve my reading of the book. But uh, the temptation, you know, like, the temptation is there. Like, when you're reading about alcohol the whole time, uh, it's, you start thinking about alcohol. Um, now... I said before there's not much of a plot. That's kind of a lie. There is kind of a little bit of a plot that emerges in the second half of the book. Uh, and this is, uh, actually, it's, it's, it, it takes center stage in the second half of the book. It's introduced very early on. Uh, and that is kind of everybody's in love with this woman named Brett. Uh, Brett Ashley, Lady Brett Ashley. Oh, again, this is all kind of based on real life. So this was a woman that Hemingway was in love with in real life. Uh, and uh, he was jealous of the other men who kind of had her affection and he didn't. And apparently there was a fist fight that really took place in real life that, that gets made into this book. Um, so she... She... Uh, everyone's in love with her. Hemingway is jealous of his friend, um, and his, the friend in real life was a guy named Harold Loeb, I think his name was, uh, who was named Robert Cohn in this book. Uh, and Harold Loeb was a Jew, and uh, Robert Cohn in this book was a Jew. Uh, and Robert Cohn does not come off terribly well in this book, and there's a lot of anti-Semitic remarks in it, uh, both kind of... The characters will kind of make remarks like, oh, I hate that kike or something like that. And also then the voice of the narrator will kind of be like, oh, you know, he, he was Jewish so he had that stubborn streak in him and stuff like that. Uh, and that is the it's a pro problematic part of the novel, uh, especially now, you know, 1920s. Uh, well, in the 1920s, you could be racist for one thing, but like secondly, it was before the Holocaust for another thing. So I think like anti-Semitism was looked upon as just kind of, you know, like one of those harmless prejudices. Uh, and the, like it's not regarded that way now at all, obviously. So um, this is, yeah, this, this, this is a problem in the novel. Uh, and it's... Um, Well, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about it really, except to say that it's a problem. Um, although the thing is, we, uh, Robert Cohen, in spite of all these kind of remarks about how Jews are stubborn and stuff like that, I didn't come off the novel hating him. Um, even though Hemingway's narrator, and presumably Hemingway himself, was very annoyed at this character, uh, I, just, I just felt sorry for him. Um, he was, the way Hemingway writes him, uh, he was very socially awkward. Uh, he thought he kind of had this romance with Lady Brett Ashley that he didn't have. Like, she slept with him, but she wasn't in love with him. And he didn't understand that because he, he didn't, he didn't, 
he was kind of coming from a different world. Uh, Lady Brett Ashley and her sets were all about kind of meaningless sex and kind of open relationship. He was coming from a completely different sheltered world where he viewed the fact that they slept together meant they had some sort of romantic relationship. And he did not understand what was happening. And I felt bad for him in this book because nobody, no, you know, like, what he needed was for somebody to sit down, one of his friends, just sit him down and say, look, you don't understand what's going on. Let me explain to you what's going on. She's not in love with you. This isn't going to work. Blah, 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 blah. And nobody does that. And instead, they just kind of make snide comments about him behind his back. Eventually, it kind of escalates to the way where they're making snide comments about him to his face. Uh, and like, you know, apparently this guy, uh, the guy he was based off of, or both of them, I guess, had some kind of annoying characteristics. They could be a little bit snooty, uh, um, socially clueless, didn't understand kind of what was happening sometimes, or didn't understand when they were, weren't wanted in situations. But, like, I just felt bad about for him, and I wished he had better friends. And to a certain extent, like, for all his faults, he, you know, he was kind of the only one in this group who had any kind of noble ideas, and the rest of them were just jackals. Um, so in spite of all these kind of anti-Semitic remarks that are peppered throughout the book, I, I felt kind of very sympathetic towards the Jewish character. Which is to say, I don't think Hemingway's brand of anti-Semitism in any way is equivalent to, you know, kind of what came after in Europe. Uh, I, like, I don't think this fed into the Holocaust or anything like that, because you don't, you don't get the sense that we need to round up and kill all these people. You just get the sense that, like, Jews are stubborn or Jews have big noses or something like that. Um, although you could make the argument that any time you're kind of othering the Jews, that feeds into the larger context of anti-Semitism. So like this, in some way, kind of contributes to the culture that led into the Holocaust. I, uh, possibly you could make that argument. Just based on Hemingway's book, though, uh, it was anti-Semitic, and yet I felt sympathy for the Jewish character. Interestingly enough, though, it's, you know, it's interesting how two people can read the exact same book and come up with different viewpoints. Uh, other person in my book club who was reading this book absolutely hated Robert Cohen uh, and, uh, you know, thought he was just, uh, you know, all snooty and kind of all, all, I mean, the character is written to be somewhat annoying. And it's obvious that all the other characters are annoyed by him. Um, but... Like, I, I didn't feel like I was personally annoyed by him. Like, I understood that other people were annoyed by him. But, like, I wasn't bothered by it. But the, the other guy in my book club said, oh, yeah, I hated him so much. He was so annoying and stuff like that. So, like, interesting, two people get completely opposite reactions on the same character. Uh, I, I wonder what Hemingway's intended reaction was. Maybe Hemingway intended for us to hate this character. I don't know. I, I tended to kind of like this character and hate... Jake, who was supposed to be the stand-in for Hemingway. Um, yeah, so uh, the yeah character argument. What else was I going to say? Um, they. Yeah. Sorry, I, I had a thought I was going to follow up on, and I lost it. Um, other things in this book. Okay, I'm just going to... Ah, yeah, now I remember now. Uh, I was watching... Again, this is all based on real life. And apparently the, the guy who, who's Bill Gordon uh, in the book, I think that's his name, uh, is attributed making a lot of these comments like, ah, oh, what a kike, or I hate that kike, or something like that. Uh, and these are all based on people in real life. And I forget the guy's name. He was, he was a real-life person, Donald Ogleave, or something like that. Uh... Uh, he later said, yeah, uh, you know, I made those comments and I'm, I regret it because I, I think after the Holocaust, of course, he felt quite sorry that he had been an anti-Semite. So at least one of the characters in the novel, based on somebody in real life, ended up taking it back. 
I'm out of time. So I'm gonna have to end this video here.